first introduction to the Filipino saints was in 1996. When the Jackson brought him here, it was in Manila. I think the crowd was like a thousand people in that venue. It was our first time to have heard him. And then he came back in 2001. Of all the ministers, I invited to come and visit us because we were in need of spiritual upliftment, having gone through some difficult times because of the breakup in our group. So I wrote several ministers, but only this brother responded. He came in 2001 and he kept coming back. And he is well loved by the Filipino saints. The youngsters call him Lolo. Amen. So I think Judeben was like three years old when he first came to the Philippines. Was it Judeben who first called you Lolo? Okay. <laughs> Lolo means granddad. So we have traveled many miles together in the Philippines. We went as far as the northern part of Luzon, Circle of Luzon. We had been to Sagada, to Ifugao, to Mindanao, in the far places of Mindanao in Surigao. So we've been together in many, many trips. In the States, we traveled from West Virginia all the way to Seattle, Washington. We were on the road for five days. It was the longest road trip and that made me realize how huge and massive America is. I was just really taken aback to see the massive place of the United States of America. And we traveled Europe as well many times from Norway all the way to Switzerland and many other places. So without further ado, let us uh, give God's word an undivided attention. Let's uh, hear not only with our literal ears, but spiritual ears as well. So I'd like to turn over the service to our dear brother from Norway, Brother Rolf from Remember, I think it was during the Second World War, 
the President of the United States, he was in a wheelchair. And he was doing the job as a President in the wheelchair. So don't look at uh, sickness and problems in that respect and say, no, I can't serve anymore. As long as there is breath inside you, and there are servants willing to help out, then you have a job to do. And you are coming from different places, from the north and the south, and the ones who are the farthest away from here, is Brother Tim, McKay, Brother Meeks, <laughs> and Brother Henry. I forget his last name, so I only call him Henry. Henry. They are just 12 hours away from here, clockwise, right? So it's a, if it is 10 o'clock now, in the morning it's 10 o'clock at night in the States. So uh, it takes an effort to come, but I'm so happy. To me it only takes six hours, so that's very short. <laughs> All right. I will not just sit here or stand here and talk. But I am favored and blessed to be in this congregation. And I want to congratulate you on a venue that is really wonderful. It's a good building and you have put a lot of efforts to have a place that you can worship. When we used to come back here to the Philippines, we were sweating. I didn't have a, a dry a squat on my body because uh, <laughs> after preaching, uh, you just needed to take a bath or a shower. <laughs> hey, because you didn't have air conditioning like that. Now, I need to even have a jacket, right? <laughs> well. I don't need a jacket, but they say it's polite to have one. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go along until I keep sweating, then I'll take it off. <laughs> well, this morning I have a little special message. And uh, I pray that you will understand what we're talking about. Because we are closing in on an age, a dispensation, where the condition in the world is going to be so bad that you would wish to be away. And you will cry out and say, Lord, come, <laughs> come quickly. Remember, you are a country who are developing a more modern society. You have more cars, the roads are getting better. To get to Sagara, back in the first days I came, it took over us 13 to 14 hours. No, we might be down to six to eight, eight hours, right? <laughs> to get up there. Because now we have concrete on the road. It was not that back then. So uh, I know that things are getting better for you in that way. But spiritually, it's getting worse. Maybe the Philippines still have some respect for God. But I live in the part of the world that you read about in the Bible. There is a dragon in uh, the book of Revelation chapter 13. And that represents the Roman Empire. And I live right in it. I don't live in Italy, in Rome. <laughs> I live in the outskirts. We're not even part of the European Union yet. But we do exactly the same. If there is laws and regulations in the Union, Norway adopt to it quickly. It's almost like the government, they wish that the people will say, yes, let's go in. I would never say that. Because I know, but I know it's coming. We cannot stop it, we cannot hinder it. But we can raise up a standard and stand for the Lord. So therefore, 
What I am saying this morning, it is not just a, <clears throat> should I say, a word of warning to the nation, but it is a warning to the individual. You have to make a stand. Amen. And I want to start in the Old Testament. It, it is in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. And if I'm going to put a text on this, it has to be communication. With what spirit? Like a question mark? Who are you communicating with? Because you and I, we are entertaining spirits. Remember, we are under constant pressure all the time. I like to put it like this because uh, well, I may be a simple believer. I take the word of God as it is and I try my best way to apply it to my life. <clears throat> and when I hear about darkness, war, rumors of war, hey, there's a lot of it. And when you live in Europe, you know that there is a condition, Russia, Ukraine, and how that the Ukrainian continent is more looking like Berlin in 1945 when the Allies finally conquered the Germans so they had to give up and Adolf Hitler shot himself in the head he was the instrument of killing more than 60 million people during the Second World War he didn't kill them but he was the instrument who started in a spirit and remember Adolf Hitler he had a bunch of, of doctors of divinity, witchcraft, soothsayers, and he was asking them for help. When are we going to conquer Poland? So they set a date secretly in their office, and then he started a war that ended up with the Second World War. And if you go back in the Bible, you read about uh, uh, the, the Medo-Persian king, Ahasuerus. Remember in the book of Esther? Right? And uh, there was this evil man, Haman. And he wanted to kill off the Jews, just like they want to do today. And they set up a calendar, witchcraft. And they throw lots, right? To cast a lot. Do you play the lottery? Right? Hoping to win a million pesos? A million pesos is not much today. So you probably have another zero or two behind it. <laughs> right? People, they play lottery or cast lots. And remember, in the days where the priests in Israel were going to decide what to do, yes or no. They had an ephod, that was a priestly jacket, and they had pockets, and the pockets met in the middle, and they had two stones. And they had one for yes, and one for no. And you were not supposed to know what was in there in the pocket. Yes or no, right? So therefore, when they were asking, uh, what shall we do? Shall we do this or that? And then they said, shall we do this? And the priest pulled out a stone. And they called it Urim and Tumim. All right? And then God was the chooser of how the priest was going to pull out that stone. Right? But you can go home and put two stones in your pocket. Right? And you'll say, no, I'm going to act like they did back in the days of Israel. Hey, that's my message. Don't do 
that. You understand me? So no, I really told my whole message <laughs> this morning. <laughs> but I want to explain a little. Because we play. There are so many traditions that man keeps doing. And they don't even know what source it comes from. Remember, there is only one God. And God looks at all the other gods that people keep telling their gods. He said, they're dead. They don't talk. They're made of stone or brass or gold or silver. And they keep occupying the man mind. So that people keep their eyes away from the Lord. So therefore, every tool, every instrument that tries to keep you away from the spiritual part of leadership in the Lord Jesus Christ is really a deviation that will lead you astray from the narrow road. Let's read. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 to 14. When you come or you enter the land that the Lord your God has given you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. I'm, I'm reading from a living translation. I don't use the old uh, King James now. I hope that's okay with you. You just read the King James if you want to. But this is a easier language that you may catch. Now, uh -huh, because it's speaking in more your daily way of, of, of communication. <coughs> and then, for example, Never sacrifice your son or your daughter as a burnt offering. Hey, you read the Bible. And the nations that Israel was going to take the land away from, they did exactly that. You go back to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 15 and 16. <coughs> you will read there. That God speaks to Abraham, I will give you this land, but you have to wait 400 years because God is merciful. Well, it doesn't say that, say that in verse 15, <laughs> but we know that's why. Because in the days of Noah, God could have killed off all the people before the flood came. But the Bible says God was merciful. So he did not kill them off. He waited till the rain was ready to starch. And during the time, approximately 120 years, where Noah was building and constructing the ark, the people had all the chance in their lifetime to change their mind and join Noah and get in the ark. But all them years and none of them even considered that this was something they needed to do. They thought it was all a joke. And I believe this world today, they think that the coming of the Lord is all a joke. <laughs> you talk about the coming of the Lord as are you sensible? Are you right in your mind? It is coming. I say, prepare yourself now. I don't say dress, put on your dress coat and, and sit on a stone waiting. Because that's not it. But you have to dress yourself inside. In your mind and your heart. That you are now preparing for the coming of the Lord. Because there are people that's going to be caught away. And it, then it's going to be too late to be caught away anyway. Right. God is merciful. He has a big plan all the way into the millennium kingdom. 
but we're not going to go that far now. So when he says there, uh, don't give your sons and daughters up as a burnt offering and do not let your people practice fortune telling. Have you been in a Chinese restaurant? After the dinner, you had your dessert. They come with a little plate and say, yeah, open and read. That's the fortune for you. You believe that? No. Hey, of course, you might say, oh, that's funny. Yes, it is funny to a certain amount. But behind it is a spirit. Right? right. right? Yeah. So remember, everything outside divine inspiration will lead you astray i'll explain that <clears throat> so don't let your people practice fortune telling have you heard the name omen o m e n what is that that is trying to tell what is coming and the results of what you see. You drive a car or you, you, you buy a, you, you're on your bike and there's a black cat crossing the road in front of you. Anyone heard about that? Anyone said, oh, oh black cat, oh, something's coming. Hey? The black cat is not a danger but the mind of a person who looks at looks for omens there was a oh it's a message something bad's gonna come and you might in five minutes you might end up in a car accident not because of the cat but because of your thought because now you can't think clear anymore you're so afraid, you're so scared, and you wonder, oh, what's going to happen? And bang, here we are in an accident. I hope it's a minor one. <laughs> but that is what an omen is. Fortune telling. Try, remember Jesus? He looked at the Pharisees and the scribes, and he accused them. Right. And he said, what you do, guys? You know why they do that? To feel the wind. And if it comes from that part, you say it's going to be dry weather. But if it comes the other way, comes from the ocean, from the Mediterranean, it's going to be rainy. And he said, you can discern natural things, but you cannot discern spiritual things. You by me just saying what I'm called to say. That should awaken a spirit inside you already to say, here it is. I like the stories of the disciples because when they heard about John the Baptist, when he was preaching, that word came up to Nazareth, up to Capernaum, and the brothers who became the disciples of Jesus Christ, they were first disciples of John the Baptist. Because when they heard that man heard about his message, can you hear about a message? Yes. You had a queen of the south, the queen of Sheba. He heard about Solomon. And when she heard that, it pricked her heart and it drew her north to go up to Israel to find out if this is true or to be blessed by it if possible. And when she had stayed there for a while, she said to Solomon, and it is written in the Bible, not half of what Solomon had as wisdom was told to her. It was much more in it. And she embraced it and believed it. 
And Jesus used that later on in his gospel. And he said, and the queen of Sheba shall come up in the day of regeneration and she shall judge you guys. It's not that the queen of Sheba is going to judge another generation in another part or time. But remember, the very people that stood by Solomon, there were a lot of them that didn't believe in him. Even he had the wisdom of God. Right? right? Jesus Christ, the wisest man on earth, had the most power of all. And all the Jews were going around and said, when are we going to catch him? Saying something that we can accuse him so we can get rid of him. You know, remember no, truth is never popular. Right, right, right. Truth goes right into your heart. It sting you. The truth kills you. <clears throat> it kills the selfishness right, in you. Right, right. right? It doesn't kill you off. Now you have a chance to repent. <laughs> so you can really live for God. But to live for God you have to be dead from your own self. Right. And when we read these scriptures of communication. Communication with spirits. Stay away from it. Don't play anything outside honestly repenting and leaning heavily on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So don't practice fortune telling or use sorcery. Remember, sorcery has to do with telling the days and the times to come. It gives, remember, all of us would like to know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. In Europe, they have big football games, soccer games. Right? In England, you have Liverpool, Manchester, and all them places. And they put in bins on who's going to win the game. And if you put the right thing in, then you have millions of dollars coming for you because you hit the right spot. And some people, they would like to go to a shaman or a doctor of witchcraft and they say, can you tell me the results of next week's game? Right? Yeah, hey. They have even movies on these things. How that a person finds a newspaper that is two years up the road <laughs> and can read history about going to their own day and they play games with it so that they can make themselves rich. Right. It's all selfishness. You might say, I'll play the lottery so I can give to the poor. Hey, you can ask the Lord to make you so smart that you can help them without any lottery at all. Right? Okay. So don't use sorcery or in interpret omens. Try, try not to interpret the future. And you say, oh, but it's so important to know the future. Yes, it is, but not by omens, not by sorcery, not by witchcraft. <coughs> You're seeking the wrong source. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That source is going to bind you because it's a spirit. And you can be possessed mm -hmm. by spirits. Amen. Remember Jesus Christ met a lot of possessed people. Yeah. So what happened? You think that possessed people were just innocent? No, they let themselves be influenced by spirits 
It maybe it started out as a game, but it ended up being a tragic thing, and they couldn't fall, go to sleep. Then, right? It kept them awake, and you you stay awake long enough, and I can tell you, you got trouble, and it won't be long till you're not yourself anymore. And then you start running around like a crazy guy. And you'll meet that man that Jesus met one day at the Gerasians when he came over the boat to the Sea of Galilee. And here comes a man, comes a man that has six legions of spirits. How can six legions of spirits enter into one single person? Hey, because it is not size, it is compressed influence. All you can think of is what that spirit causes you to think about, and you turn crazy. Right. But when Jesus came by, all them spirits started speaking to him. And Jesus said, shut, shut up, keep silent. He didn't allow them to speak. Oh, you say, can we have that power? Brothers and sisters, if you stay close to the Lord, you already have power. Amen. Right? Amen. If you don't play with sorcery, omens, and that stuff, then the devil can not influence your mind and heart. Remember, the Lord never told you to fight the devil. He said, resist him forbid him to enter into your mind and thoughts because if you forbid him then he cannot enter in and start to confuse your mind okay what i'm saying today you're going to experience it you may have experienced it already maybe even many times how things try to influence you to make you unstable because to walk with the Lord and serve the Lord Jesus Christ eh, don't do that we got a smarter way and we are gonna win this war we're gonna make you rich we're gonna we're gonna share all the goods that you're gonna steal <laughs> hey they are just a bunch of liars they don't want to share with you and if they make that money, you know what they're going to do with you? Kill you. So they can keep the money for themselves. <laughs> yeah. So resist the devil. Stand up against him. Remember Michael one day in the, in the letter to Jude? The Bible says there that Michael never fought. A war against the devil. The only thing he said, the Lord rebuke you. So he stayed out of it. Remember, the only time an angel is going to go for an attack is when the Lord inspires him. Because there is coming one day that the devils are going to be cast out of the heavenly dimension. Read that in Revelation chapter 12, where one third of the stars of heaven were cast down on earth. Hey, that's the devil's gang. That's his company. And that's going to happen in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel. The last 42 months of the human, not history, it's still prophecy. Right? So the devil, is, he, he has a domain, he can go and talk to the Lord. And you know what he's talking about? He's talking about you and me. Because he is seeking, searching for a way to get inside you and me. He is quite busy. And remember, he has hundreds of millions or angelic persons to assist him in the work to get you and me but I'll tell you don't get nervous 
Because for every devil that comes on the road to hit you, there are two positive angels on your side. <laughs> because there was only one third of heavens that were thrown out. Where are the other two thirds? They're on God's side for your protection. So even if it is scary, remember the devil wants to scare you, so you have to do some methods to do it. But if you can have the eyes of Elisha, remember the enemy came to capture Elisha and they have surrounded the whole city and now they're gonna close in to get that man that was always telling the king of Israel what the king of Syria was doing because there was a servant in the king's army that said no there is not a spy in our midst to tell what you're thinking but in Israel there is a prophet and the Lord God inspires him and he tells him what you are thinking on your pillow. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, that king said, well, let's go get that man. So we can get rid of that. Because I want to have a plan that is watertight. But when uh, they came to surround the city, and Elisha's servant said, my, what are we going to do? This is hopeless. We're surrounded. And they said, no, there's more people with us than there is with them. Amen. And he looked up and said, Lord, can you show the servant what I see? And suddenly the servant's eyes are opened. Hey, that is what we want, right? Have open eyes so we can see that we are protected. But God in his wisdom is not going to let us see too much because he wants us alert, attentive. He don't want us to have a nervous breakdown, but he wants us alert and alarmed so that we don't go to sleep. Because if we say, oh, I've got the Lord with me, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't care anymore. Hey, my Lord don't want me to go to sleep that way. He wants me to stay alert. Therefore, he allows the devil to put enough pressure on me and on you so that we stay awake. So that we are always in need of prayer. Mm -hmm. Hey, you come for prayer. And you ask for healing, we lay hands on you, we anoint you with oil, and then suddenly you feel relief. And, oh, hallelujah, now I can go home. But before you come home, there is something else. <gasps> right? You got one problem solved, here comes the next. And you say, my Lord, I thought I was done with the problems now. But you're never. Because God needs you alarmed, ready. You understand what I'm talking about here? Right? I think I'm talking in a simple terminology. Yeah. To make you really look at the windows of prophecy. Hey, remember, we have the Bible. And we have a lot of prophecies that are fulfilled. But we also have a lot of prophecies that are not yet fulfilled. And in our mind, we are, we are searching diligently what prophecy is coming to fulfillment now, right? So we, we might even make a list. One, two, three, four, five. And two, 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 two. Like, this is coming, that's coming, this is coming. But we have no idea how it's going to appear. How it's going to be fulfilled. We, we read the scriptures. We know the fulfillment. Is the Lord on the winning side. But the game itself. The Lord keep to himself. Right. 
He don't want us to know that part. Right? So therefore, <laughs> there might be people call themselves self-prophets. Right? But they are mostly self-appointed prophets. Because they only prophesy to benefit themselves. They prophesy so they can get an airplane and fly around the world. They prophesy so that they can have people who will lay down in dirt so they can walk on them. So their, their feet don't get dirty. They want to use you as a doormat. And if you see that spirit, fly away from it. That's not a prophet of God. That is a soothsayer. Exorcist. Witchcraft. You say, hey, is there witchcraft? <clears throat> oh yes, it is. Verse 11. Or cast spells. Or function as mediums. You know the story of Saul? Right? <clears throat> Sa uh, Samuel? He said, Saul, your days are over. The Lord has chosen another man that are better than you. Because you don't listen to God. You are only looking for selfish protection. And to be a servant of the Lord, you cannot do that. So therefore, after Saul had fought David for several years, now there was no one that could tell Saul what would happen up, up the road. Do you know what's going to happen up the road? I don't think you do. Of course you have the scriptures, the Lord's coming. You're counting on the rapture <laughs> to get you out of here. Well, of course, that's a good thing. But remember, from now till then, there is a road to walk. And then you need to know how you're going to walk that road so that you can enter into the rapture season. And that is the tricky point. Because God don't want to tell us. Hey, how many have heard predictions about days of the coming of the Lord? Huh? The Lord, <laughs> yeah, he was going to come in 77, prediction. And he was going to come around 2000. And then they have set up several different dates of the coming of the Lord or of major events that's going to benefit the believers. But when the people are using that as an oppression machinery to gain victory over your mind, they're going the wrong way. And remember, you don't need to listen to it. You better not listen to it. Because it can entertain a spirit that will kind of confuse you. Alright. So here, or cast spells, fortune, as mediums or psychics, or call forth the spirit of the dead. That was verse 11. Hey, there are people today. Especially in the eastern part of the world where people really don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they have other religions. You have Buddhism and you have other religions where they have shamans. Hey, we have a shaman in Norway now. He tries to marry the princess of Norway. He's a black fellow, and he thinks that he knows things. Of course he knows things, but he doesn't know things that is of value for a spiritual person. Because what they do is to confuse the mind. Yeah. They think that they know your help. Remember, you can look at me, and if you're a doctor, that's how Robert Stroman, he has this problem, that problem, right? Just by looking, 
is, oh, I know you. Right? But they really don't. They're using their books and their experience and trying to make a statement of condition. Remember, in William Branham's life, the best, I will say, spiritual brother that have been facing this earth for the last hundred years, that man never used experience to diagnose health problems. Hey, he probably, remember, he had seen thousands of it. So he could probably have said, you got this and you got that. But you know what he did? He waited on the Lord. And when he waited on the Lord, and if the Lord didn't say anything, he just prayed for that and said, oh, serve the Lord. Didn't say a word. But if the Lord came and revealed his presence and told about the sickness and even how it came to. And then if he saw the dark shadow of death leave the person, then he could say, you can go home, you're healed. Yeah. But he didn't say for whole long. Right? That man could go out of the church door and say, I am he. Am I healed? Yeah. Right? And as soon as doubt comes in, here comes that spirit. I got you. I got you. That preacher was wrong. Yeah. yeah. Remember, it doesn't take long to start to disbelieve. Remember, often we go by feelings. If I feel fine, I'm healed. But if I don't feel fine, oh, it's back on me again. Even if it is not, it's just feelings. But that's the way the human mind often works. All right, verse 12. I was hoping that I was going a lot faster here, but I'll just take my time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that I, the Lord your God, will drive them out ahead of you. But you must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you are about to displace consult sorcerers and fortune tellers, but the Lord your God forbids you to do such things. So therefore, oh yes, you can go to the Chinese restaurant. They can put that little slip in your hand, but don't look at it. And that is the leadership of the Lord. That is the leadership of the Chinese restaurant to try to get you back again. Right? Yeah. Because it might say on the slip, this food is so good, you want to go back. <laughs> and it creates. <laughs> okay, I want to go back. I want to go back. <laughs> All right. I hope you understand what I mean with this. Let's go to Leviticus. And I hope that you take time to go through these scriptures more than once. Because you will meet the challenge on the road more than once. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 6. <clears throat> I will also turn against those who commit spiritual prostitution. What is spiritual prostitution? Remember, prostitution is a common name among men and women. Prostitution, whore down. That means play with the other person without taking, uh, <laughs> taking control. And uh, that was another word I was thinking about but taking charge of the situation and also want to live with that person. Remember, whoredom and prostitution is really whoredom without commitment, right? So don't play. Remember, 
when you say something, uh, last uh, on, on Monday, I, was, I talked about being salty. Right? So in the wedding, I looked at the couple who are not making a severe promise to each other. We're going to live together, promise to stay together through good and evil, through sickness and health. Right? But when sickness comes, some people say, now you're sick. I don't want to be with you anymore. And, they, and salt lose its power. Because salt is a preservative. That means if you make a promise, you stay with it. And the longer you stay with it, the more saltier you become. But remember when I say the more saltier, that means your words will tell in a wider range that this one is a truthful and honest person who stays by his word. Because I know that some that salt can be too salty too, right? Yeah. In Norway, when we kill an animal, and before the days of refrigeration, we needed to dip the meat in salt. We, we just immersed it in salt and let it cure for months. <laughs> and when we took it out, my! I can tell you the first thing you see is the lunch, mm, that's salty. But it keeps the meat. It doesn't rot because it's salty. And that's the way you and I should be. If they try to take a bite of you, not fleshly but spiritually, and they find you're a man of your word, you're salty. All right. <clears throat> so, I will turn against those who commit spiritual prostitution by putting their trust in mediums or in those who consult with the spirits of the dead. I will cut them off from the community or from the land. So here, prostitution is really put in as an act in a spiritual way trying to find out what is coming for you without putting the Lord in it. Remember, you can easily close your eyes or keep them open and say, Lord, what's coming for me? And the Lord might not even speak. And he says, oh, he don't talk. I try to, I have to find a medium because I need to know right now what's going to happen. Hey, that's a trap. The devil wants you to do it and the Lord is holding back to see if you're salty, if you will stay with your promise because you promised, I repent, I let myself be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask the Lord to fill me with the Holy Ghost. And when the Lord does that, then you have all the instrumental qualities to be led by God's Spirit. And really, you should not have to ask the Lord at all times, what's coming now? What's coming now? I'm confused. I need help. I need answers. Right? very impatient the Lord don't like that he wants you to put his you trust in him and let him do the guiding I have seen several times I'm not going to explain it but I've seen several times that when severe problems was up the road God would give a good dream even if you didn't ask for a dream because you didn't even know that the problem was coming. Right. And then the Lord, He gives you a dream and you woke up and you said, oh Lord, what's that? That cannot happen. <laughs> right? And a few days later, it just happened exactly as you saw in the dream. And you said, my Lord, you are telling me to just trust you. 
because you saw this coming and you told me ahead of time so that I can have confidence and still walk by faith. So yes, God will absolutely tell you when you need to know. But He doesn't tell you when you want to know. Because He, he considered you dead. Right? You repent, you die. Then you get buried, you're baptized, then you're buried. You're never to speak anymore. <laughs> right? About your own will. Now it's only the will of the Lord. So that's how these things work. So therefore, if you want to hear from God, then be a dead person to yourself. But alive for God. So that He can do His work in and through you. Right? In Leviticus chapter 20 again, uh, I want to read verse 26 and 27. You must be holy. Have you heard about holiness? What is it to be holy? Well, the scriptural understanding of being holy is to be taken out of this world. Right? That means out of worldliness. And set aside for a different job. A proper position to serve the Lord. So to be holy is to be set aside to serve the Lord. Are you holy? You judge for yourself. Do you feel that you really have placed yourself out of the worldly way of thinking? Not, not all the little small incidences in life, but the basic part, I'm not of this world anymore. I have placed myself before the Lord I'm going to serve Him with all my heart, all my power, all my might for the rest of my life. Right? Then you have put yourself into a holiness. And then you will listen to what He says and you'll do what He tells you. So you are a holy. You must be holy because I, the Lord, are holy. I have set you apart from all other people to be my own. Hey! That's what it is. You are set apart to live for the Lord. That's why you come to this convention, right? Amen. You have set apart time, location, because you want to hear what the Lord got for us. Right. Hmm? Right. Yeah. Men and women among you who act as mediums, or who consult spirits of the dead must be put to death. Hmm. That doesn't sound good, right? I remember in the Old Testament, when they started out, the Lord had a way of correction that put some fear in the nation of Israel. Because they say, if we do like that, we might end up dead too. So we better not do that. But as time went, Israel got slack in mind and when they started doing what caused the other people's death and they got by with it, they said, oh, now we, we are allowed to do it now. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't mean that God wasn't against it. But He was not going to kill everyone. He wanted to put up examples so that the people would learn to walk right with the Lord. Okay. <clears throat> so here, he says there, they who act as mediums. What is it to act like a medium? That means you are able to contact the dead. But remember, it is a lie. Remember, do you know one guy who knows you pretty good? Lucifer. Hey, do you think he keeps records? He keeps records of your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather. And haven't you heard 
that when you walk is all, oh, you're just like your father. Right? Just like your father. Hey, I, I didn't know your grandpa. And you're just like that. And you know, the devil can use all that. He can use angelic powers, dark powers, to influence the mind of people. There was a man, he thought he knew me. And he come and he poured his index finger right here in my heart. And he said, I know you. <laughs> and I could have said, yes, brother, you know me. <laughs> But I said, sir, you don't know me. And that was the last time we poured this index finger into my chest. <laughs> right? Because they want power, influence over your life. Don't let that happen. If someone comes and they take authority, I know you work and you have a boss and they might be bossy at times. But remember, there are limits and borderlines for how a boss can work, right? And if they go overboard for any length of time, you can leave the place, find a better way to work. <laughs> ah. So, but don't let yourself be overwhelmed by people who think they know everything. And when they say they consult the spirit of the dead, Brothers and sisters, there are Christian people who are overwhelmed with that type of spirit. Yeah. I'm saying, stay out of it. Amen. Don't get involved. Amen. Because if you try to play with it, you will end up in the trap and you will start thinking like them. Okay, also verse 23 and 24, Leviticus chapter 20. Do not live according to the customs of the people I am driving out before you. That was the story of Abraham, you know. It is because they do these shameful things that I detest them. What was the shameful things they did? They tried to find out about people, their future, without consulting God himself. Right? And it will always end up wrong, dead wrong. Because there's only one who knows your destiny. It's God. Amen. He's the one who knows it. I have promised you, verse 24, you will possess their lands because I will give it to you as a possession. A land flowing with milk and honey. I'm the Lord your God who set you apart from all other people. Remember now, you might say, oh, this is the Old Testament. It's not valued anymore. It's absolutely valued today because God sees your spirit and he wants to check you if you really want to live for him. Uh, in Numbers chapter 23, verse 33, or 23, that's a longer story. It is the story of, of Balaam. Right? I'm not going to tell you a long story because you read it. You're familiar with it. Right? But Balaam, he was a prophet. And when he told things under inspiration, he was right. And remember, you might meet people that prophesy over you, and it may be right. Right? But, you're not only going to check a person's prophecy, you are going to check on a person's character right don't take a prophecy just for the word that is said it might be a person you like a person that is important oh I have this person and he prophesied over me 
Right? So no, I'm safe. But it might have been a prophecy said under a different circumstance and under different mindset ways so that it's not going to end up good. And here is a man and he's speaking the truth. I'm only going to mention verse 23. No evil power has effect against Jacob. So that means sorcery, all kinds of evil power, witchcraft, none of these will have any effect on Israel because they have cut off all the strings of divination. They don't believe in that. They remember Israel 40 years in the wilderness. You have a different story with Stephen in uh, Acts chapter 7 and 8. Uh, we can come back to that later on. But here, whether they have the tent of Bullock dig in their suitcase, they have a star of Rephaim. Hey, that is really sorcery. That is witchcraft. So they were carrying in their saddleback reserved gods so that if God didn't speak, at least we can pack up our suitcase, lay on a blanket, and start on our own so that we can be safe. <laughs> Don't you think that God knew that? Right. He knew every suitcase in town <laughs> and what it contained. But the prophet Balaam, he said, there is no sorcery, there is no witchcraft in Israel. And that is, and I will have to say that there is no witchcraft, no sorcery, no omens that can come up, shoot up, and take control in Israel. Hey, because they have them in their saddlebag, but they didn't dare to pick it up because it could be discovered. And they needed to have a certain block of men that would agree. Then we can privately take a little session. Right? So Balaam prophesied the very right thing. Yeah. But he was a false prophet. How can a false prophet say things that are right. And he even spoke with the Lord. Yeah. Because first time he spoke with him and, and the Lord said, they have nothing to do with these people, they're mine. Leave it alone, don't touch it. But then the other king came with a lot of money. He came with millions of dollars. <laughs> he said, eh, 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 sir, why don't you just say something about Israel so that we can have some peace of mind? Yeah. And Balaam said, I'll go and ask God again. Hey, if the Lord tells you something, don't ask him that again to change his mind. Because God is perfect. He sees the end before the beginning. Why should he give you a second message? And if a second message comes, it is to trap you, to see if you will live for God, or you will live by your money and your own thoughts. And Balaam, Balaam, he asked the Lord a second time, and the Lord said, go with them. <laughs> and of course then he feels happy, hallelujah. Uh, and he gives this little prophecy. He cannot curse Israel because they're blessed. But he wished he could help Balak so that he could have a bigger home, a castle, a Mercedes Benz, or even an airplane so he could fly around because I'm an important person. Right? I'm a friend of Balak. 
But you know, Israel went into that camp later on. You know what they did? They killed the people and they killed the prophet. Balaam. Because he commemorates or he collaborates with the wrong source of people. Remember today, it's 2024, and there is a great challenge upon the true seed of God to see if you will stay true to what God has revealed in your own day. Right? And there will come so many inputs from the side, up, down, back, wherever, to try to make you rethink what you thought you had as a revelation. Hey, do you think you have a revelation? Might be a little dangerous to see it. Because there's one listening, I'm going to see you laugh. I'm going to change your mind. If you say you have a revelation, I'll work on you till you don't have one. And I will use all the means in this world to make you change your mind. And today is the day where that just happens among believers, real believers. Yeah. Can the real believers do that? Well, do you know the story of Korah and Dayton? Hmm. He had a group, he was a family, and in his family, in their tents. Remember, they were still in the wilderness, on the way to the promised land. But in the tent, there was a daily or nightly conversation. You know what that was? Moses. He thinks it's important. But we're all spiritual. We're even the seed of Levi. We're even in the priesthood. Now we're not the chief priest, but we're going to get it. We're going to find out something about him. And then we're going to take control of the whole church. And that spirit is alive today. Right. Yeah. As it was back 18 or 1400 before Christ. That spirit is always attentive and always placed. So therefore, if there's someone used by God, you can make sure they are highly criticized in the dark corners. Of course, they will not call it the dark corners. They'll say, this is the light. We got the truth, we know. But actually they don't know. So therefore, then Korah and Dayton, they got the courage and they spoke to their friends in the same family and said, we need to do something about this because Moses is taking too much charge. And remember, Moses was only doing what God told him to do. Hey, that is the problem even today. Because we have a society. We need to be a part of society. We have to blend in. You don't have to blend in. You have to look up and say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? But that is not popular in the secular world or in the religious world. The religious world has so many programs because they want to win people for the Lord. And they think by no lady, helping, we're going to win them. Okay. Remember, there's so many tools you can do in the natural to win people. But you cannot put a revelation inside right. by the use of money or any type of help. You know what is going to help people to have a revelation? As one simple uh, scripture in St. Luke, where Jesus Christ is talking about Lazarus, 
and the rich man. And in the dialogue after they died, the rich man, he was crying over to Abraham. And he said, my, I am in a bad hot place. Can you send Lazarus back up to the alive people that are alive and warn my brothers? Because this place is so bad. You know what, Paul, uh, what Abraham said? They have Moses and the prophets. Amen. And the rich man said, uh, is my back's going to help? They don't know. You know, you need a miracle. You need a sign. You need special attention in the spirit world. And then you're going to change. Hey, God did that ten times in Israel when there were slaves in Egypt. He turned water to blood. He made frogs come up. Lice, mosquitoes, fire, hail, and all the firstborn in Egypt. And the last one, let them walk through the Red Sea with their sandals on and they didn't even get wet. Hey, if you have done that, will you start to disbelieve the Lord? Three weeks later? Or have you had a commitment that you say, I'm going to serve the Lord the rest of my life. It doesn't matter what happens. I am a believer from no one. Hey, I can guarantee you, you will never even keep three weeks. Because science and wonders don't do the trick. But Moses and the prophets, they do the trick. Because when you read your Bible, you are feeding yourself with the experience that the prophets had when God spoke to them. Remember, all what is written in the Bible are testimonies of people who lived before the Lord and were ordained by God to, to write it down. Because that is the tool God is going to use to quicken your heart. So that when you read a scripture, so not a miracle. If you see someone raised up from the dead, after a week, you need to see another one raised from the dead. After a month, and if there goes two years and you don't see a miracle, you might say, oh, I'm out of here. Nothing is happening here. Because you look in the wrong direction. You don't look at Moses and the prophets. Or Jesus and the apostles. Because that, is the drive inside you that will keep you alive for the Lord and have the desire to see God operating in your own day. Hallelujah. All right. So Balaam prophesied the right thing, but he was a false motivated person. Brother Branham spoke a message on the false anointed ones in the end time. What was the message about to cut it short? It's really the anointing hits the wheat and the weeds. It hits the true and the false. Because if you're in the same congregation and the right mind and spiritual person starts praising the Lord. Here comes an atmosphere. We call it the spirit of the Lord. Right? And then the false person that have a false motivation, they feel, they sense the same atmosphere and they start to rejoice also. Yeah. 
And then you're, oh, everybody, hallelujah, that's wonderful. Yes, it is. But you have to be alert. Not everyone that praises the Lord is actually the Lord's children. Some of them are only trying their best to copy because they are out to take control. Right? Back to Moses and Korah. So Korah, he got, remember, when you read the story in the Old Testament, he took the best men, the leaders of the tribes, of the 12 tribes, or 11. <laughs> He took the leaders and he was able to gather 250 men that were renowned. Right. Yeah. Everybody in Israel respected those 250 men. And they all came outside Moses' camp, his tent. And then Moses, come out! <laughs> We got a message for you. <laughs> and he came out, him and Aaron together, and they stood there. And they saw 250 men plus Korah and Dathan. And they said, Well, guys, what do you want? You're all holy. You take too much upon yourself. So we want part of the leadership. Moses looked at them and said, if they are going to have part in the leadership, this church is gone. Right. There is no way we will survive in the wilderness. Because he knew the motivation behind it. Therefore he said, can we ask a deal? Can you follow a little thought? And say, well, why is it? All of you home, grab a plate of copper and put incense and fire. <coughs> Bring it here and let the Lord do the choice. And whoever God will rest upon will have the leadership because it's not the leadership of men, but the leadership of God. And they said, okay, all right, we'll have to do that. So they went home, came back with a plate, each of them 250 plates. And they all had burnt incense, and they were standing there. And they said, Well, Lord, we're standing here. You do the choice, no Lord. Who is going to lead, be instrumental of helping Israel to get to the promised land? So you, you tell us now. And suddenly fire came down from heaven. And it consumed 250 men. And Moses and Aaron were standing there. And they were not hit by the lightning power. But you know, when the 250 men was dead. And the place was rolling around. <laughs> right? <laughs> I could hear the place falling on. <laughs> Finally, they laid on. And the people, they backed off to a secure mine so that they wouldn't be hit. But you know, it did not change the people. They said, You, Moses, you kill them. <laughs> hey, Moses didn't have a sword. He only, well, he had a two edged sword with his voice. So they, they tried to go up against Moses again. Even seeing that God has spoken. <laughs> and when that happened, fire came from the Lord and started consuming people. The worst characters that was mingling in the group. God took them down, and Moses said to Aaron, Take incense, spread on by among the people. Pay obedience to the Lord for them, so he doesn't take them all out. 
But by that time, 7,000 people had died because of disobedience to the Lord. Yes, that's right. Amen. I can tell you, brothers and sisters, we are living in a Gentile age where we don't see the restrictions of God administering His wrath. You can be glad for that. We are in a merciful uh, age where God is merciful towards us. But when you come to the Lord, you better come with an honest heart, leaning on Him. Let yourself die out and let Him rise in you because you are in a spiritual battlefield yes. and if you play with the gospel you will soon be out yes, right. well, I'm going to be killed maybe not but it may be that you will say oh, I don't believe this anymore I'll go out I'll go anywhere I can be a Baptist a Pentecostal I can be anything yeah because we're living in the days of grace and I don't need to sit and listen to this. This is too strict. Well, but if you're dead, how strict can it become? Right. Have you gone to the graveyard and see people protesting there? There's no one of them protesting. They're dead and gone. And that's what we were supposed to be. Dead and gone. <laughs> All right. Psalms. Chapter 88, verse 10 to 12. Are you, are your wonderful deeds of any use to the dead? This is the psalmist who is speaking. Remember, you might say, we should pay respect to the dead. Right? That's a very common way. And back in the days of the apostles, Remember, the Romans, they went to the graves and they paid respect to their family, fathers, grandfathers. They were talking to them like they were alive. Hey, talk to the Lord. Remember the days of your deceased parents, grandparents? They are gone. You should honor them while they are alive. It's like send me a flower while I'm alive. Right? You put a flower on my grave. Well, I don't see it. I can't do nothing with it. Uh, hey, I don't say that you cannot put a flower on a grave. But I'll say, what is the intentions? Right? So he says that, do the dead rise up and praise you? Of course you know they don't. Can those in the grave declare your unfailing love? The Remember, today, while you are alive, is your chance to do the right thing. But remember, the right thing it's not always what pops up in your head. The right thing is the inspiration of the Lord. What He puts in your heart to do. That is what you ought to do. Right? Remember, I could sit home in Norway in my good chair. But I can't. Because I'm supposed to go somewhere. And you must say, you're 75 years old, almost. You're still hanging in there? You're still alive? Well, as long as the Lord keep you alive. And keep a message inside. Then you have a job to do. Hey, Moses was 120 years old. And he was still in his strength. When the Lord took him. All right. 
Can those in the grave declare your unfailing love? Can they proclaim your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Can the darkness speak of your wonderful deeds? <laughs> Can anyone in the land of forgetness, forgetfulness talk about your righteousness? Hey, that is the scriptural psalm in the Bible that says the dead are dead. Amen. Remember, there is no link of communication between the dead and the living. Right. If you hear your father talking to you, or your grandmother talking to you, it is not your father or your grandmother. It is spirits trying to confuse you so that you will start having a different way of communication. Don't listen to anyone that has gone to the grave. But what if I have a dream and someone that are dead speak to me? Well, then I'll tell you. You search through the scriptures to see what is it talking about. Because one day Jesus went upon Mount the Transfiguration and two dead people <laughs> came and talked to him. Moses and Elijah. But it was in a different dimension. Jesus walked into a dimension that the disciples could not go into. But God allowed them to see what was going on. And Moses and Elijah, what did they talk about? They talked about Jesus' crucifixion. So, so if someone speaks to you, and they speak about the truth that is coming, right? And it comes from him. You may be alert. You might say, okay. But remember, it takes the anointing for God to lead you on, right? Hey, you can have experiences that God showed you that this would come. But you cannot create it so that it will come. God is the one who creates it and let things go on. I say this just to make, to make you understand. I have read all portions of the scriptures to try to show how we should behave when things like that happens. Right? Psalms 115, verse 17. <laughs> the dead cannot sing praises to the Lord. For they have gone into the silence of the grave. All right. Remember, uh, here in the Philippines, I, sp I spoke on custody. I didn't do it here. Verse, uh, I did it here also. Yeah. Okay, custody. <clears throat> so when a person dies, he goes into, he doesn't go into prison, but custody is also signified as a type of a prison. It is just that when you go to custody, you are not yet judged. There is a courtship coming where he's going to tell you what you did and the reason for you to end up like this or that. And then the Lord will put you in the position. But custody is a waiting place. And here, when you look at this one, there is no, they have gone into the silence of the grave or custody. And remember, they cannot make communication with the living, right? So don't, if someone, there could be a shaman or one with witchcraft or 
soothsayer or witchcraft and they come to you and they say, I know something about you. Do you know the story of William Branham? He was uh, going on a bus and uh, beside him there was a lady and she started talking to him and immediately he understood that woman as is a medium in the spirit world and brother Branham did not want to have anything to do with her so he kind of put away remember don't entertain that spirit right. it's dangerous if you play with it you might be caught Amen. and it might be hard to get out of it <laughs> yeah. but that lady came after him and she said you are born under a certain sign Amen. and when brother Brandon heard there that he knew we are into a medium here I and she told the truth but those people they don't tell the truth just to tell you the truth they tell the truth to capture you to make you an instrument under their power they want you to be it's all right that's something for you to stop. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, those mediums and Brother Branham, he heard what she said and he just learned through it. Yes, they speak a lot of things that are true, but they don't know the reason for his battle. Why they said, right? You are here for a certain under a certain sign for a certain uh, job but they cannot tell you what it is and detail it because that is between you and the Lord right yeah. Ecclesiastic chapter 9 verse 5 to 7 the living at least know that they will die but the dead know nothing. Hmm. They have no further reward, nor are they remembered. Hey, how many of you know the life of your grandpa or your great grandpa? I don't want you to answer it. Just think about it, right? Hey, I'm born in 1949. My grandfather died in 1945. The Second World War had a hard toil on people in the world. So he was one of the 60 million people that uh, did not really get through the Second World War without being killed or dying. I know nothing about my grandfather. I cannot tell any stuff. Hey, my father told a few things, but to know the man? No. And my great grandfather, I don't even know his name. <laughs> because that was back in the 1800s. Right? Another 50 years ago. And that's what the scripture here really says. Is that they have no further reward, nor are they remembered. I only know that I have one father, and that is Noah. Right? He came out of the ark. So therefore you are my brothers and sisters. Because your father is Noah as well. Right? So that's as close as we are. <laughs> okay. So, whatever they did in their lifetime, loving, hating, envying, is all done. They no longer play a part in anything here on earth. So therefore, the good advice 
don't play with that spirit because they have no part in what's... Remember, they had a part when they were alive. They were going to prove something in their lifetime. No, it's your time. It's our time to prove what God had installed. If He anointed you, you should be very happy. And you should be able to wage on Him. To start to inspire your life. You may, some people say, oh, the only thing to, to do to serve the Lord is to win thousands for the Lord. Well, some are called to do that. Other people may be called to brush the teeth of a person that cannot brush his own teeth. Amen. And you might say, oh, I want a life. Brushing teeth to the disabled. Oh my God. And oh, I'm going to win thousands of songs for the Lord. <laughs> hey, you might do a better job brushing teeth. If God is in it for you, you do your best part. Brother Branham said one time, he said, if you are called to see a doormat, where people brush the pipe before they enter into the house, be the best one. Right? So he knew what it was to be called for God. I remember Sister Glenda and Brother Blake, they got married in Faith, they went to the conventions to Faith Assembly. And when I heard that man preach, my God, he was a ball of fire. So I said, he is probably going to travel the world because he has such a spark. He got married and they got a son who were disabled. And he ended up brushing the teeth of his son. The son is still alive. The son is around 40 years old, disabled, cannot talk, have no language. And not brush his own teeth. But I think Brother Blake did a great job. Right. Yes, yeah. he did. Hey, once you you think you have a calling, right? And then when things cross and that calling goes in the drain. Maybe it was not God's calling. Right. It was just you that called yourself. Exactly. Because you wanted to be important. And importance is not in here on earth. Right? If you have to fight a battle, battle and be a hero, then the only way to be a real hero is to hear the sound of the Holy Spirit whispering into you and make you do the things that He wants you to do. Not what you want yourself to do, but what He wants you to do. Right? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 8. I probably used a lot of time this morning. But uh, a little more, is it okay? Oh, Alright? I hope you're not sweating here. We have air conditioning now. So you can have a comfort zone. Someone may say to you, let us ask the mediums and those who consult the spirit of the dead with their whisperings and mutterings. Can you say, uh, like a medium? Right? Whisperings and mutterings. They think they talk to the Lord. But they are oppressed by evil spirits. And the evil spirits have control over their lives. They will tell us what to do. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Should the living seek the guidance from the dead? Shall you go to your father's grave and ask what to do? Shall you stay on the graveside of your grandfathers and grandfather? What do you want me to do? 
One thing is for sure, you will not hear the voice of your grandfather. And you will not hear the voice of the Lord in such doings. It will be spirits that can connect into your spiritual experience and start talking and you will be confused in a greater matter. Yeah. Should the living seek guidance from the dead? Look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contra contradict his word are completely in the dark. So if you want to consult mediums and familiar spirits, you are putting yourself into a greater darkness than what you already are in. Don't go that direction. <laughs> yeah. They will go, verse 21, they will go from one place to the other, weary and hungry. And because they are hungry, they will rage and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven and down at the earth. But wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. They will be thrown out into the darkness. That's the result of taking contact with any other spirits. Hey, I know that there are a lot of nice people. They go around with bowls and they beg and can you give me a piece of this, a piece of that. Hey, you should be friendly. I don't tell you to be hostile, angry and beat people. But stay away. Because it is not fruitful to go in that direction. Let us take just at least one scripture in the New Testament. So you don't think that I'm old, only Old Testament. <laughs> in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Remember, chapter 12 follows after chapter 11. What does chapter 11 talk about? It talks about the spiritual leaders of the Old Testament. You say, yeah, but they, we're talking about them now, Old Testament, they're dead, dead in a long time. But remember now, God does not speak about the dead. He speaks about how he inspired the dead. Right? Why is Hebrews 11 even written? It is to tell us that to have faith in God, you need inspiration. Because every person that you read about in chapter 11 was inspired to do what they did. That's why the Bible says, by faith, Noah built the ark. By faith, by faith, by faith. And you know Noah didn't say, oh, I think, woke up one morning and said, oh, I think I'm going to build a boat. <coughs> No, God spoke to him. And he did exactly what God told him to. That's why I want to put one extra word to the word faith. Faithful. Right? Noah faithfully did exactly what God told him to do. Amen. So therefore, Paul is not trying to just favor the dead and speak to they that have gone on to be with the Lord. But he is speaking specifically about the inspiration that led the people to do what they did. <coughs> and that is why the Hebrews 11 is written 
And Hebrews 12 says then, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Now, remember, you say, I'm going to have faith for this, you're going to have faith for that. It's okay, you can have faith for a lot of things. But that is not God's faith. That is your way of expression of what you want to do. But when God speaks to you, and you do what He says, then you have God's faith. And that's the one you are. So, when I'm given this little title and this little message this morning, it is not just to talk to people or medium, but it is to be inspired by the Holy Ghost so that you can do exactly what He tells you. And you don't need to go any other direction to try to find out what God wants for you. You will not find it by the graveyard or by a shaman or a witchcraft or any of that. They will mislead, mislead you. Right, right. That, that's, that's the main point about it. But you see God in the Holy Spirit and He will lead you on. And you will have God's faith. Alright. <clears throat> so let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Let us slip out witchcraft, soothsayers, omens. You see? Slip off everything that tries to stop us from the direct con uh, contact with God's Holy Spirit. Right? Especially the sin that so easily trips us. What is sin? It is disobedience. And remember, we started off when you start now living, don't contact the dead. Right? And if you do, it's disobedience. Very simple. Right? And let us run with endurance. The race God has set before us. And remember, no witchcraft, no omen, no shaman will be able to know what you're supposed to do. They will tell their version so they can capture your spirit and keep you in prison. But you, God has set a race before you or before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith by direct inspiration. Remember Jesus said, I can do nothing of my own self. What I do is what the Father shows me. I do likewise. <laughs> that was the best man on earth he never did anything of his own self he did what he was ordered and commanded to do all right because of the joy awaiting him remember you have a joy awaiting you right you sure have if you stay obedient to what god tells you he endured the cross disregarded the shame Remember, you can walk a path that sounds shameful to you. Remember, the cross was not a highlight in the world. That was the most shameful thing. And Jesus said he took it because he knew the outcome. And if you stay true to God, you will know the outcome of it. He endured the cross disregarding its shame. And now, where is he? Sitting in the place of honor besides God's throne. So you want to sit on that throne? Remember Revelation 3.18? They who win or overcome shall sit with me in my throne, in my government. Praise the Lord. All right. I have more scriptures, but have I made myself clear? Yeah. You understand what I 
I'm saying? I hope it is simple enough. So therefore I'm going to leave you now <laughs> to yourself to think about these things. What about the dead? Can you communicate with them? And if not, if you do, whom are you then communicating with? Right? That's the secular way of thinking. I hope that you never try to communicate with that type of spirit. All right. May the Lord bless you tonight, tonight, tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow, right now. Hallelujah. Shall we stand up? Let us just have a word of prayer. Change your position a little. Give you a chance to wake up. <laughs> I hope I didn't make you sleep. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for the advice of the Bible, the Holy Word of God. You see, Lord, a community, an assembly with small children and up to people that are of high age. I pray that you, with thy spirit, will inspire and prick the hearts of each and every one, from the youngest to the oldest, so that we can see the seriousness of walking in your presence. And don't, if you don't talk fast enough or early enough, then help us, Lord, to have patience to wait on you. So that everyone that's going to do thy work, thy way, can do it in a perfect timing. May thy blessings be upon each and every one. That is my prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I'm honored to be here today. I hope you feel the same way yourself. And congratulations. God bless you, brother. With this wonderful place. Amen.